Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we are talking to the hilarious Whitney Cummings. Whitney is a comedian, actress, writer, director, producer, showrunner, author, and most recently, podcaster. In this episode, we talk about comedy, codependency, and so much more. Thanks for coming on my show, Thanks Whitney. Thanks for having me. This is so great. I can't believe you're so beautiful. You're so pretty. I thank you. Do people always screw up when they talk about how pretty you are? Well, I almost said you're almost prettier in person, but then I was like, I don't know. Oh no, you want to hear you're what I get? You're just as beautiful in person. No, how about that? First of all, thank you're you. You're welcome. Um, I always get, oh, you're not as big as I thought you were, <laughs> right? What do you get? I get, don't listen to them. They're just jealous. <gasps> And I'm like, who's them? Who? Because people are talking listen shit where? about you. Yeah. We don't listen to the haters. What haters? Oh, okay. <laughs> it just like causes me all this anxiety. People with that's the worst thing ever. Or they'll just come up to me and start talking shit about my own friends. They'll be like, they'll name a female comedian. I don't even think so and so is funny. And I'm like, she's my friend. <laughs> like, we don't all hate each other. Or they'll just start insulting my friends or, you know, stuff like that. Oh. Yeah, I think you're hilarious. Don't you listen to them. Oh my God. Wait, who? It's like about your character and your job. And I do have a theory though that whenever someone comes up to you in public, the first two things they say are compliment. The third thing is always an insult. Get out after the second thing. Oh, give me an so example. It's like, I love you. You're so gorgeous. You're not as big in person or right, whatever right, the right. thing is. It's yeah. always the third thing. No, that you're so, yeah. so correct. I do think, though, that with Instagram now, with podcasts now, people feel very close to you mm -hmm. and they feel like your friends, you know, they've heard you and they've listened to you for what? Do you like 20 this? hours? Do you like it? Does it give you stress? Sometimes it is stressful because you're like, it throws you when someone just comes up to you in the airport and it's like, hey, how's your knee? And you're like, how did you know about my, oh, right, I talked to him. You know, like it's definitely a little bit jarring sometimes. Like right. I think as a comedian, having uh, sort of an authentic connection with people yeah. is helpful. You are the epitome of a multi-hyphenate. You I are. But you're an epitome of multi-personality. No! This <laughs> <laughs> but you are, you're, you are, I mean, I was just, I was just saying all your accolades just here right now because I do a little pre-record and I got to say all of them and I got a little bit out of breath. But when somebody <laughs> comes up to you and asks you, what do you do? What's the first thing that you say? Don't you know? <laughs> someone no. comes up to me. I'm like, don't you, what do you think I do? <laughs> like, I, you, you tell me, why did you recognize me? Uh, I, I, I'm a comedian. Okay. I'm a stand-up comedian. That's my bread and butter. That's the thing that um, I care the most about, that I feel the most qualified to do. And the other stuff kind of just felt like, I don't want to say digressions from being a stand-up, but just sort of like natural progressions from doing stand-up. And I think one of the hardest things these days, you know, with a lot of the women I see in comedy, it's not about what to do, it's about what not to do mm. or to figure out when in your timeline you should do it, mm. you know, based on your self-care or the kind of life you want to have. You know, it's like, okay, here are all the things I want to do. I'll do this, I'll tour for the next five years, then I'll do a talk show, then I'll do it because then I'll have a child and I'll want to work different out. You know, like, Interesting. I'm really trying to be uh, careful about how multi-hyphenated I am and when. Are you doing the right thing for yourself right now? No. With all your, oh. No. <laughs> no, I said I'm trying. I love your Because I was succeeding. No, I, I, people say that and I'm like, oh God, because I'm like, I feel like I'm giving 30% to everything and I would like to meet, you know, I think I was doing so many things in my late 20s, early 30s because I was afraid I'd never get the opportunity again. I was always told you don't say no. You just keep saying yes. Yeah. And I'm, and it's kind of the same response and then you get to have the opportunity later yeah. to say no. Right. All right. You're in that position now. I think, and I think for me, the thing that's been working is yes, but not right now, mm -hmm. you know? That, yes, that is something I want to do, but I want to be able to do it really well and with eight hours of sleep yeah. and with joy and ease. Because you know what your thresholds are now. That's right. I, do you wish that you had that advice when you were younger? Yes. Is that I what wish, you would say? I wish someone had said, you know what, this might be too much for you or in this iteration, you might not have things like balance mm. or things like life experience, which is going to make your art better, mm. you know? So I remember sitting in a writer's room. I was doing 
three TV shows at the time, and a writer was pitching on a story idea for my character to go to a baby shower. And I was like, people don't go to baby showers. Like, what? that's ridiculous. And they were like, no, you don't, because you don't have a life. <laughs> so when you want to be creative, but you don't have a life, it's really hard to pitch on stuff. It's really hard to uh, write authentic stories that resonate uh, to the people that do have lives. It's a great example. You know, so workaholism, I think, sometimes tends to compromise our creativity, you know, and I now understand, I wish someone had explained this to me sooner, that art imitates life, but in order for art to imitate life, you have to have a life. You have to have a life. You have to have something to comment on. You have to have something to criticize, you know. So I now understand that if you're in a writer's room on a TV show, you let your writers go home at 5 o'clock. You don't stay till midnight because you want them to go home and fight with their girlfriends and fight with their husbands. To get inspired. And, and to get inspired and <laughs> to come back the next day with stories. That's such good advice. It's just, I think, I just thought work, 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 work at all costs. But then you're sitting there and you're like, no one wants to hear stories about work. I have no. to go out and have a life. And I, 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 I didn't understand that till relatively recently. That's amazing. So, but it all first started... Back in the day, mm -hmm. here you are. You're at you're at uh -oh. UPenn. Uh oh yeah. You're also modeling at the local mall. <laughs> King of Prussia. Hello, King of Prussia. Hey, I have been there. Hey, yeah, you've been to King of Prussia Hell yeah. Mall. In Los Live in the, Delaware. I took the bus to King of Prussia Mall and I would walk around in bridal gowns. Uh, up and down the escalators, always got caught. Uh, <laughs> and I would do fit modeling, which is when people come and they don't want to try it on, so they can you try this stuff on. And then I would model pantyhose, which means I would stand on a block with pantyhose on and a white shirt that went like down to here. And like I would just stand down? like a button down. Yeah. Oh, you didn't do this too? No, but that just sounds so degrading. Correct. To, oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. How yes. much were you getting paid? Uh, $115 an hour, which was a big deal for me. And you had to come in with your own hair and makeup done? Oh, of course. They gave you like the Bobby Brown uh, instructions. So yeah, I had to go spend $300 on makeup to make $115. Oh it cost me money to do this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> But you were doing this while you're going to Penn. Yes. And you got through Penn in three years. I did. People are like, you're so smart. I was poor. I think I missed a lot of the social experience of being in college. What did you think you missed? Because I didn't go to college. You know, look, I don't know. I, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I do think Ivy League schools are kind of like a eugenics program. I mean, I guess it is. <laughs> the idea is to meet a bunch of people. Sorry, legal. Uh, to meet, not that sorry. Um, to meet a bunch of people who you're gonna marry or develop, start businesses with and sororities and fraternities. I never did any of that, but I was like, I gotta work, I gotta get out of here. And I knew that I was gonna be a performer and I had a fear in me, which I actually don't have anymore now that I've actually been in this business, believe it or not, but I had this fear that was like, you can't be on camera if you're old. So you got to go. I had oh. that fear in my brain very early. But a lot of performers, I think, are told that. This was before high def television. I was already worried about it. Like, you need to make it while you're young, while you'll still be hireable. Interesting. Yeah, which Who is- put that in your mind? I don't know. The movie Sunset Boulevard? Where would I have gotten <laughs> that as a child? I mean, I, the, I grew up in DC and I just knew. I was like, you're, there's a day where you'll be old. My mom was very, very beautiful and her looks were very important to her. Mm. And at a very young age, I saw wrinkle creams, I saw mm. masks, I saw a nervousness about, I Aging. saw this and the, yeah. Isn't that interesting what yes. our parents put on us? And I don't think she was even thinking about no, it. She was just doing I was what just she wanted. I was just watching her. Yeah. And I didn't, I lived with her, single mom, and we didn't have a lot of like TV. And I was bored and I would go into her bathroom and put makeup on. And it was like anti-wrinkle, 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 you know, and it just, yeah. it got in my head and I don't blame her for it. In that time, your looks as a woman was kind of, kind all, of you all you did have. Yeah. So good for her for, you know, spending whatever currency she had and hustling. Yeah, she worked at Neiman Marcus in Bloomingdale's and would get a discount. So she'd come home with these very fancy creams and uh, I would, you know, I, but I just started thinking about that at a very young age, which breaks my heart on some level. Yeah. But I remember having that 
at a very young age, that thought. It's, it is interesting. It's interesting that you even like bring that up. Do you want to, are you planning on being a mother someday? I am. I froze my eggs. Woo! Yeah, that shit is on ice in Redondo Beach. That is uh, a process. It's a big process. Can you walk us through the process? Yes, I can. Um, you hatch, at, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> So uh, a brilliant writer named Dana Fox, we were on the set of a movie and she was like, you need to freeze your eggs. And I was like, this lady's crazy. How old were you? And I was, I want to say 28, 27 maybe. I was even maybe younger, 27 or 28. I didn't do it for five more years. Okay. But she put this thing in my head that was like, okay, you're going to freeze your eggs when you get a chance. And she said something that really, as someone that grew up without health insurance and car insurance, there was always like, anytime something went wrong, it was like, you know, a saga financially. And I remember she was like, it's like getting insurance. Even if you don't use them, you know you have them and you're going to make better decisions because you have them on ice. And I remember going, okay, I like that. I like that. And when I was 33, I did it. And the way that my fertility doctor explained it, he really helped me. He just was like, look, this might not be for your first kid or your second kid. This might be for when you're 42 or 43. And you're like, you know what? Let's do one more. Oh, that's good. I hadn't heard that yet. That is what made me go, ah, okay. You're not telling me I can't conceive at 36 or 37. You're not telling me that I'm, you know, my uterus is molding. Like, this is okay. I can hear that. <laughs> this is about just good planning. And I'm very, like, I like to plan because I think planning is freedom. Yeah. I also found myself around... 30, 31 years old, lowering my standards for guys because I felt the ticking clock and I was like, ah, it's fine. What's three ex-wives? It's fine. You're Six just, kids. You know, like, totally. He doesn't have a job. Yeah, what's some guy with three DUIs? I'm so judgmental. Oh, I found myself, you know, lowering my standard because that fear started creeping in. Of, right. You know, you start doing that math. Of, okay, if we go on a date tomorrow... In a year, we'll move in together, and then we have to get married. I just that, you know, and I was doing that, and I was like, okay, then I'll be 35, and then what if I... And I was also hearing a lot about women who were trying so hard to conceive, but the second they stopped trying... Yeah. I don't know the science on this. Correct me in the comments. But there is something about our bodies when we stop releasing cortisol and adrenaline, we can conceive better because our body's not in fight or flight trying so hard to conceive, right? right? So a lot of women that I heard froze their eggs, they had an easier time conceiving solely because they had an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. We can always use the eggs. So here you are, you got your insurance policy. Took pressure off. The last thing we all need is more pressure. Right. So once I found out how much money it was, I felt a different kind of pressure. But I also felt like this is an investment in myself. This is a business decision. It is such a miracle what happens to your psyche when you freeze your eggs, it, I started booking tours. I started, you know, being in relationships, not out of fear. I, Mm -hmm. my standards for a guy went up. It was miraculous. Wow. It took away this timeline and this, you only have a couple years to find the person. See, you are smart. Oh my God. You're this right. is why you got into you. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, it was a very fear-based decision that ended up alleviating my fears. You know, the only thing that bummed me out, I got in a little bit of, fight, of a fight with one of the fertility doctors because he was like, oh, you know, so if you have, you know, a kid at 37, you know, as a geriatric pregnancy, and I was like, let me stop you right there. Apparently anything after 35, they call geriatric. Yes, I've heard this. I've heard all of it. Like, I know way more about pregnancy now I, than I- course. I would hope so. I ever, yeah, six months <laughs> into this, I'm like- I well, I should learn something about that. <laughs> but this is this is awesome, and I do think more people need to be talking. I think about more it. people need to be talking about it. I think there's there's maternity leave. There can also be egg freezing leave. The yeah. sh- it you get more money as a company yes. if you let your employees freeze their eggs yes. and arrange for that time off. Because that's the, this is the thing nobody told me about egg freezing. It is relatively time consuming. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to go in and get those sonograms every other day to it's see wild. if they're you know every. Happy. Thing. properly. I don't know the terms. Um, you got to bring your shot around with you. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, to just, it feels kind of badass to be like just stabbing yourself in the <laughs> stomach all the time. And then you have to go get them extracted. So it was for me like a three to four month process. And I remember being in the car, like crying, just being like, Cheryl Sandberg told me to lean in and here I am. Ah! You know, cause biology is sexist. It is. It and is. you, but you're also a huge fan of the brain. I think it is a disgrace 
that we are not taught the way our brains work, the chemicals and neurochemicals that we emit, because when women emit certain neurochemicals, we're called crazy and psycho mm. and insane. Mm. And women take that shame on and they take that um, to mean that they failed in some way or they're crazy and they internalize that narrative. And I just, I made a movie about neurology because I really wanted to show women and men to be able to go, oh, I'm not crazy. I'm just emitting adrenaline and cortisol. The and, female brain. Yep. And this is a fight or flight. This is the name response. of her movie. Yes. Yes. The female brain. The female brain. And I wrote it with Neil Brennan, co-creator Chappelle Show, brilliant uh, comedian. So good. So great. So it's very balanced. It's not like a lady movie. I have men coming up to me on the street going, this movie saved my marriage because I now understand that when my wife freaks out, she's adrenalized and she's producing cortisol. And I say, you know what? Let's talk in three days when the cortisol is worn off. Wow. And in developing a, a vocabulary for our neurochemicals, I just think it's such a shame that we don't learn that. You're saving marriages and relationships. Whatever. I've broken up a couple too. <laughs> It's a joke. It's a joke. I love it. Can't wreck a happy home. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but, yeah, I just, I get very defensive when women are called crazy or insane or of psycho course. or any of micromanagey sensitive. I think it's really important to learn the evolution of the brain, epigenetics, epigenetic imprinting. You know, I know. Can you tell me about that? Yes. Epigenetic imprinting is so important because— Let's just say it. Epigenetic. Epigenetic. Oh, it sounds sexy when you say it. It sounds dorky when I say it. No, it's not. I like it. I like it. Tell me more. It is about how the chemicals that the mother releases while the fetus is in utero, the fetus becomes addicted to those chemicals. Okay, so give me an example. So I found myself as a teenager constantly being uh, attracted to, you know, dramatic situations dramatic relationship, all the gossip on the playground. And then in my 20s, I'm dating, you know, really unavailable people, people that call, cause me adrenaline, cheat on me, whatever. And then I started learning about epigenetic imprinting, which is when the neurochemicals of the mother are emitted in utero, the child is born addicted to those chemicals. So I was born addicted to cortisol and adrenaline. My mother was in a really bad marriage when I was conceived. Mm. So chances are, I came out of the womb like that. Whatever the mother is addicted to is passed into the neurochemicals of the brain. And that liberated me from going, okay, what's nature and what's nurture? Some of these things I can, that are my part, I need to go to therapy, I need to fix that thing. But also, I got this, honestly, this adrenaline addiction, because adrenaline turns into dopamine. It's like a drug. Mm -hmm. Drama is like a drug. Mm. And I became addicted to it in my mom's belly. And it's not my fault. And I can now hack my brain to s change my tolerance to adrenaline. So, Okay, two questions. Yes, ma'am. Do you blame your mother and how do you deal with it? I don't blame my mother. I have nothing but compassion for my mother because- That's, a, that's beautiful. Not only compassion, such- That makes me feel a little bit better going Reckless forgiveness because that generation didn't know. They mm. didn't have the tools. And this science wasn't even available back then, mm. you know? And the fact that she was staying in a chaotic relationship to try to keep things serene with her kids and to try to protect her kids breaks my heart every day, right. you know? Because it's, it's just a reminder that when we take care of ourselves, we actually take care of everybody else. Right. You know, her instinct was gotta take care of the kids, gotta stay in this chaotic relationship. And then the tragic irony is that that actually is, you know, sometimes harder. And how do you deal with all of these issues now? Today, I mean, I did, after I learned about neurology, because also both of my parents had strokes, and so I had to talk to neurologists all day, every day, to understand what happened. Um, I have a lot of addiction in my family as well, and when you're struggling with, you know, people that you love that are suffering addiction, learning about neurology and how addiction works is the only thing that will stop your heart from getting broken every day. So mm -hmm. I had this kind of crash course in how to hack your brain. So for me, I worked so hard to stay away from dramatic situations to lower my adrenaline and cortisol levels. I try to stay off Instagram. I try to stay off gossip sites. I try. I was to gonna say like Instagram kind of, I mean, it'll constant spiral adrenaline. you yep. into self-doubt, self-worth, you know. Yep. Who is this person dating yep. now? Yep. I, I do you have, have someone that handles your social for I you? I do. Good for I you. I have someone. I outsource it to somebody else as a form of self-care. Um, I put my phone in uh, grayscale, which makes it black and white, because yeah. a lot of what's so addictive about it is the color. Oh, that's interesting. I know. I didn't even know you were this tan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You... Jimmy Coco spray tan. Hello. Oh, he's the best. I know, right? I need Jimmy Coco. I'm yes. albino, and I just have to accept it. <laughs> you just look so healthy, and like you sleep. Well, 
Well, no, I'm not sleeping. Is it hard to sleep with that? Yeah, you have like a body pillow. Thing. Yeah. Oh God. My husband, ha I, he's like, you have no use for me anymore. I'm like, I'm. <laughs> you can rub my feet. <laughs> That's so cute. I'm terrified of being pregnant. I Now was. that I've learned epigenetics, okay, I'm so now terrified because I'm like, no one can stress me out when I'm pregnant, but that's It is important to not be stressed out because it does, like you said, go to the baby. Mm -hmm. And like people have told me, like, don't be in stressful situations. But I work out. I try to eat well. Mm -hmm. Like I am going with my cravings. My cravings have been really healthy, which is a blessing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to work and stay focused yeah. and also like gain information about my baby. But- the, I try to step away from fear because this is just, this has been going on. Like, this is how we got here. For thousands of years. Right? Before it's gonna, all of this. And it's going to continue yeah, to women happen. Women used to do this without doctors. Exactly. Somehow. And now In I watch the, the documentary that Ricky Lake did, The Business of Being Born. You have to watch it. Oh gosh, it I, is so good. I read the Naomi Wolf book about the four cesarean sections and stuff, and I almost had a heart attack. It is really ridiculous how cesareans are a business. Yes, correct. unless I mean there are the moments where like you have mm -hmm. to have them, but right. it's a business, right? And so you have no fear around this. So after seeing the documentary, now I just want to have an at-home birth. Like, I want to be able to stand and squat and push my baby out and, like, mm -hmm. pull it out of me and put okay. it right on my chest. But Pull it out? Is that how it works? Yeah. You push the head out, and then as the shoulders are kind of coming out, they're like, okay, go down and pull your baby out. And then you, like, you're squatting, you pull it out, and you're like, oh, a miracle. And then you're just, like, glad like, you're both alive. clean it off first? No. People kiss their babies and their lips get stuck to their faces. Like the, the Christmas story, like the tongue and yes. the foam pole? Well, not that stuck. Um, but we could probably go on and uh, on forever, about that. Forever, but I, this is so wonderful to see. And I think that like visibility for women that are pregnant while they're working is so important because I just, my I still have in my head, you have to stop down for a year. No. That's an old story that I have in my head. I had that too. I had it too. And I had like, you have to have a baby in a hospital. You have mm -hmm. to have a, all those things. Yeah. I am working up until this due date. And then after that, I'm going to take like eight weeks off, mm -hmm. something like this. And we're just going to go from there. Yep. I'm going to have the kid on my tit. And we're just going to go. It. Yep, yep. <laughs> this is very exciting, inspiring. I mean, I just think... The pregnant, I can like hardly carry a purse. Um, You'll be fine. Okay. I want to talk about your book. I'm fine oh, and other stories or other you. lies. Yeah. Other lies. <laughs> There's so many lies. A lot, litany of lies. But I like how you're so open about codependency. Thank you. And I feel like my readers, my readers, are you guys reading this? <laughs> are, you guys, are you guys literate? <laughs> I feel like my viewers and listeners. There's audiobooks available. Yes. Most people get the audiobook. I, I feel like they can really learn something from your experiences. Codependency, you know, I have been so public about it because I think it is it is this epidemic that's sort of everywhere but hard to identify. And, you know, it's part of the narrative of I'm just crazy, I'm a psycho, you know. And a lot of people who are codependent are the type of people who it wouldn't occur to them to think about themselves because we are the type of people pleasers who are only thinking about others, rescuing, martyring. Um, and Can you explain like what some examples are? Sure. So, or like what exactly it is, the like sure. actual definition? So codependency, the definition that I work off of, which I didn't make up, but it is the inability to tolerate the discomfort of others. Yes. It, a lot of people think of codependency as like couples who can't stop hanging out. That could be that, but that's also a litany of other things. But if you find yourself obsessed with someone else's perception of you, if you find yourself thinking that, you know, you need to take care of other people's feelings, if you have a hard time saying no, if you mm. find yourself being addicted to control, always needing to control a situation, if you find yourself embarrassed about other people's behavior, you think you need to take care of everybody and deal with their consequences, you Got take it. on the consequences of others. If you find yourself in relationships or friendships that don't really make you feel good, but you, you feel like you them. have to stay in them. Codependents use words like, we have to go to this thing. I have to get him a gift. I have to go to this party. We do a lot of things out of obligation because we're worried that we're going to lose the approval of others or not be liked if we don't go. We put everybody else's needs ahead of our own. So when did you find out that you had codependency? I really put it together when I was 
became a boss for the first time. And I found that I was hiring all my friends, even though none of them were qualified. <laughs> and I was trying to- Let me help you. I know, yes, I want to give everybody a job, which there's something to be said for that, you know? And I still am able to do that. Like a heart of gold, but you're loyal. It, but now, but that doesn't ultimately uh, end up being the kind thing to do because it blows up and becomes a big mess and that person doesn't learn about, you know, earning it and consequences and what have you. So um, I've learned that uh, we take care of everybody when we take care of ourselves mm -hmm. and that, you know, we don't bring our personal feelings into work and we don't do things out of guilt mm -hmm. or obligation and we don't confuse love with pity. Uh -huh. Sometimes we do things out of pity instead of out of, you know, mutual respect or we conflate love and pity and kindness is not always kind right. and being nice is not always being nice. So here you are, you're a boss. So when we do a nice thing and hire someone that you know shouldn't necessarily have the job and then we resent them the whole time because they're not doing it right and then everybody else on staff has to clean up the mess, that's not really kind, is it? Mm -hmm. It's making a big mess because you want to be liked mm -hmm. or you want to do the nice thing. So that was tricky. I found myself not being able to fire people. I found myself not being able to give honest feedback because I was too worried about making someone feel bad wow. or them feeling rejected. Mm -hmm. And I went uh, to a rehab for a family therapy group and I brought a giant thing of protein bars and clothes and cash like to help the person in my life that was in rehab. And they're like, they're, you're, no, what are you doing? You're trying to fix addiction with, with protein bars. Get out of here. You, can, you know, I found myself so desperate to fix somebody else and rescue somebody else wow. that I wasn't actually doing the right thing for the person. So, you know, we run around trying to help people all day as a way to get out of our own feelings. Something that I heard early in a 12-step program was people-pleasing is a form of assholery. That's <laughs> Because sometimes funny. it's selfish yeah. because it's not really what the person needs. The person might it's what you need. The person might need to, if you find yourself in the middle of someone's relationship drama all the time and listening to them every night talk about over and over about the, maybe they need to stop talking about it and they need you to actually draw a boundary, you know, and or say no. So I found myself enabling a lot of people with addictions and personality disorders and went to my first twelve step Al Anon meeting. Was it game changer? Totally game changer. Wow. Because I found that, you know, whereas alcoholics can be addicted to alcohol, codependents are addicted to people who are a mess. So what do these programs look like? These programs are basically free therapy. And I see so many solvent, rich, famous uh, people now talking about therapy, and that's so cool. The one thing we're leaving out is that it's $300 an hour. Yeah. And not everybody has access to that. Right. So You're like, I'm going to freeze my eggs. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go, go to therapy. To therapy. <laughs> Everyone's like, you have no problems. <laughs> <laughs> so I think as someone who did not grow up with money, um, I really appreciate the fact that it's free and open and available to anyone. And it's not elitist. And there's also people from all walks of life who are in there keeping you humble. Mm. And what's so great to me about 12-step programs is that you know, when we share our shortcomings, when we share vulnerabilities and see someone like what you're doing right now nod, you're able to go, okay, I'm not crazy. Someone's and you're, hearing me. You're able to have grace. And someone's not judging me. And I'm not a disgusting piece of shit. Mm. You know, you're not going, ugh, when you say like, I really want to text this ex who was awful to me and cheated on me, but I kind of want to reach out to him anyway. And people go, been there. And you're like, okay, I'm not crazy. So wow. these this inner critic that we have of... I'm a failure, I'm a mess, all of these things goes away because you have a group of people that look at you saying, been there. And you talk about codependency landing you as some pretty terrible relationships nasty, too. Nasty, nasty stuff. What have you learned from that? Codependence, we tend to shapeshift in order to make a relationship work. Uh, we tend to um, make sure, you know, the temperature is always 70 degrees, audition for approval every day, um, whatever you want to eat, I'm going to eat, you're vegan, I'm vegan, you eat meat, I eat meat, you know, we you know, you like Mexican, I like Mexican, anything to sort of uh, get approval of the person we want to be in the relationship with. We end up compromising our values, morals, boundaries, and bottom lines in order to make a relationship work. So right. I found myself in, in the relationship I'm in now is the first time we experimented with, hey, I need you to call me every day. Oh. If you can't, that's totally fine. If you think I'm crazy, that's totally fine. But I finally know what I need, and that's something I need. And how empowering that you can say that to the person you're dating. And he, it was so wild, because I thought he'd go, yuck, you're crazy, bitch, psycho. And he was just like, oh, thank you for being so clear. I, like, I don't want to be guessing what you want. He was trying to play it cool by texting and didn't want to call too much. And I was like, I would like to hear from you every day. 
on the oh. phone as a phone call. So in recovery, what we do is we find out what we actually want and then how to ask for it That's and how to awesome. walk away if we're not getting it. I love that. Which is maybe something I should have gotten as a child and a lot of people do, but if you grew up in an environment where you weren't parented in a certain way or, or were in an environment where nobody really said what they felt mm. and everyone was like, no, I'm fine, everything's good. That's how my family was. When there were problems, nobody addressed it and everybody pretended they were fine when they weren't. And so that's what I learned. I learned a kind of dishonest communication that doesn't benefit anybody. So you talk about a lot of problems. <laughs> you do. I That's mean, my brand. it's kind of a awesome. lot of problems. It's awesome though because you're Why so not? open. Because everybody needs to talk about these things, and you just so happen to have a few. So but you, I just I, and you're open. I see the most exciting thing in my lifetime is happening right now, which is that women are becoming bosses. Yep. And they have shows with 500 cameras and they are making money and they have employees and they're getting in the workforce and we weren't really parented to be able to manage conflict. We were parented to establish harmony and make sure everything was okay and make sure men's feelings were okay and that women weren't mad at us. Right. That's how we've been conditioned. Right. You know, and that was a big part of my codependence. And so I sound the horn on this so much because it helps That's us once good. we get these opportunities we're fighting so hard for, yeah. we're not going to screw them up by trying to be friends with everyone. No, I'm Or making sure everyone likes us. Exactly. And I think that that's very important because a lot of women do have that kind of, it's like a ticking time bomb in them. Yep. And I have to remind myself too, like, what would a man do? I do. I ask myself that. Yeah. Yep. Do you ask yourself that? I ask myself that some sometimes I think that way or... Um, I go, what would a man do? Let me, how do I not do that? Uh, or or right. how do I? Oh. Taking what, the, I just oh, yeah, mean, yeah, in, ter yeah, I just yeah, mean yeah. in terms of like. I guess when I'm going into yeah. like a meeting, yeah. I'm like, would oh, a man I see. not <laughs> worry about being friends with everybody? Or, yes, And I know a lot of men I mean. that are, you know. Yes. Not all men. Always no, have to say that. Men. Hashtag not all men. I know. Um, but I do think that, that we do want to make sure nobody's feelings are hurt. And, yes. And, the key is managing being sensitive and being emotionally intelligent without being codependent. Exactly. There's emotionally a line. Emotionally intelligent. That's the key. I like that. If, a, if an employee is underperforming because they don't feel seen or heard or the workflow yeah. isn't something that works with the way their brain is wired, it's always helped to go, hey, how can we make this so, you know, we're able to have more harmony without going, and what's going on with your family and your, how can I fix your marriage right. and all that other, let's go get drinks and hang out on the they, weekend. They don't do that. Go for five hikes yeah, yeah, a yeah. day. So in your latest special, that's called Whitney Cummings, Can I Touch It? Yeah. Can Every I time touch I say it? it in my head, I'm like, can I touch it? Can I it? touch it? I know. It's, <sighs> such a, it's such a weirdly like triple entendre uh, title. And the reason I called it that is because um, I had this robot made for the show, Ridiculous. And I talk a lot about sexual harassment in the show, how men were grabbing asses and, you know, being inappropriate. But when men saw my robot, they were like, can I, can I, can I touch it? And I was like, where is this, all this when it comes to a human woman? Like, why, you don't ask that when you, you know. So I just thought that was interesting. That is so, so when Very. I saw the robot come out, yeah. watching your, uh, your special, I mean, first of all, I was like, it really looked like you. It really, it was not just know the something? outfit, it was the makeup, it was the hair, it was, it was creepy. You know what's wild about this? Because I feel like your fans are, you know, in this world, I don't think she looks like me. Really? Here's why. We she's a little cross-eyed. We don't. <laughs> You're not cross-eyed. She she's, was a little cross-eyed. She's totally cross-eyed. Like, yes, face. <laughs> oh my God, she's yes. so good at that. <laughs> she did that. Her eye, one of her eyes were fixing. Oh, She's okay. in optical surgery. Because this how week. much does she cost? Oh, honey. Can I touch it? Uh, she's about 50 grand, 50 to wow. 70. Yeah, she's getting, her eyes are going to be camera soon, and we're working on more facial muscles so that her smile isn't all like creepy. Which and is probably why you spent 25 minutes of your special with her. With right? her. And by the way, I have to, no joke. I've already lapped her in terms of age in the year I've had her, so we're adding little wrinkles around her. So oh that's... my gosh! Because <laughs> we looked the same a year ago, and I haven't slept, so now I, you know, I look like the old age app version of her. That's so funny. So we're aging her up a little bit. But something fascinating uh, that I found out is we only see ourselves through mirrors, mm. so we don't really know what we look like, you mm. know, in addition to whatever other dysmorphia we're struggling with. Um, she doesn't creep me out because I don't see myself that way. That's how other people see me. 
Got it. So that that's why you don't think you look like that's her. That's right. Isn't that wild? I feel like she looks a lot like you. I understand what you're saying. We're all optical illusions. Everyone thinks she looks exactly like me, except me. And it, it there was a weird... Because you think you look better or worse? I think I look just different. Okay. This experience has been pretty therapeutic for the body dysmorphia that I deal with. Because you have talked about this. I had eating disorders my whole life. I now would say have disordered eating. I, I think it's okay. dangerous to say like... I cured my eating disorder. I think okay, so it means you're constantly thinking about it still, but it's not plaguing your life? I, exa- I have thoughts come up sometimes that are like, you should have a Diet Coke for dinner. And then I'm like, no, you shouldn't. Whereas I used to think that was a good idea. Mm-hmm. I now think it's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. So I think for anyone to say, you know, just in terms of how eating disorders work, because so much of it for me was about control. Mm-hmm. And so when things get a little out of control and I get a little busy and I don't have time to go to the gym, sometimes my brain will go, oh, yeah, you should just have, like, lifesavers and nothing else. Right. And then I go, no, no, we're going to go home and we're going to make a meal and we're going to cancel that thing and make sure we That's great because you've actually gone and you've gotten help and mm-hmm. now you know how to handle all these situations. Yeah, I did a pretty amazing um, sort of boot camp on inner child work, which I first thought was ridiculous. Uh, cause it was just like, ah, an imaginary child. This is creepy. I don't like this. Like the, I, I would always think of the, the kids from the shining, those two girls at the end of the hallway. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, yes. But it really is you having a relationship with your own inner child. And the cheat for me was you feed yourself the way you would feed a five-year-old child. Mm. You know, as soon as if your own five-year-old, you would make sure have three meals and, you know, eats healthy and right. you wouldn't want to give them a complex. So you go, yeah, sure. You can have that piece of cake or whatever but then as adults we're like you shouldn't eat that that's you should skip dinner I like that idea you you should just you know drink black coffee all day you would never let a child eat like that so it's just a little bit of if I was feeding a five-year-old how would I feed her because of the eating disorder Mm -hmm. your boobs were they grew in different sizes okay however as I've talked but I have minor different sizes this one hangs more than that one you know what are you right-handed or left-handed I'm right-handed but I sleep with my hand up, so it's pulling my tit over. Really? I figured it out on my own. I didn't have to go to a doctor. After I talked on stage about how my boobs were different sizes, women come up to me and they're like, I thought I was the only one. I mean, I think this is a, I don't think any women's boobs are symmetrical. No, they're not. How unsymmetrical were yours? I mean, they were, they were, they were. Like an it was A like and a, a D? Like a Salvador Dali painting, like, <laughs> like the clocks <laughs> dripping off the table. <laughs> So three surgeries. It was three surgeries because the first surgery, I was so embarrassed to tell anyone. I was so embarrassed to get it done. I had so much shame around it that I like Googled it and just went to some guy by the airport. (laughs) And he like didn't have an office. I know. This was before the vulnerability was in. You live in LA and tits are everywhere. No, when when this happened, this was before like, let me share my flaws and let's all talk about how like broken we are. These girls have been getting like, 16-year-old, like, birthday presents are like, oh, here's some free tits. Yeah. I think maybe because I'm in comedy or I oh, okay. I, okay. I just okay. had shame around my body in general. Mm. And I guess my emotional perfectionism was I don't want to tell anyone that I'm doing this thing. I didn't involve any of my girlfriends. I didn't tell anyone. And then I finally let a girlfriend in on what happened when uh, there was, like, a muscle was cut through. And she was like, oh, just go to my guy. What are you doing? All my girlfriends were like, well, go to my person. Go to my person. And two friends had reductions. So I'm like, go to my And there was no shame around it. It was all in my head. Oh, wow. Anyone that has judgment around that shouldn't be your friend anyway. Yeah. But none of them did. I know. I show all my friends my tits. Great. I mean, I've yet to see them, but maybe Later. it's because of all the cameras. But so I just, I had so much shame around that because yeah. I think I'd worked so hard to like accept my body that I thought this was like a setback, you know? But for me, it was really about sort of erasing in a big way, like the sort of the things that reminded me of the disordered eating yeah. and what my body was like back then. And I really just wanted to get past that stage. because every do you, do you look at them now and you're happy about love it? Them. <gasps> love them. Love them. I mean, I have scars and all sorts of stuff, but hey. I'm, if, if, I'm, if I don't, then who will? Back to the robots really quick. Uh-oh. Just because I watched a special on them mm-hmm. and I heard that a lot of people just buy them to have sex with. Mm-hmm. Is that the research that you had gotten as well? There's, so the actual robots, there's not a, I mean, I would imagine they're they're so expensive 
that right. I think, you know, a lot of guys are like, this like, oh, is, that's yeah. expensive sex. Like, he's totally. So there are the, the real doll sex dolls that yes. are specifically yes. for sex. Okay, so there is the sex doll Mine and then there's Mine has a robot, robot head, which right. not a lot of these have been made yet. Right. But the sex dolls, I would imagine that's the purpose they serve. When I went down to the sex robot factory, I actually learned some very interesting research because I thought it was going to be a bunch of perverted, gross madness, just jizz fest, um, don't take a black light to it. But they were explaining a lot of people that buy these are handicapped or it's a lot oh. of people who are trying to explore their sexuality and they're not ready to do it with a human woman Therapy. yet. I'm sure a lot of it are skeezy, gross. I also heard it's like men who don't want to have to deal with women anymore. Well, there's that, or men with erectile dysfunction or whatever, right. uh, have lost what, whatever. I would imagine there's a little bit of that. And for those men, good. Yeah. Stick with a doll. Right. I don't I don't want the men that are done with women to be out of bars or on <laughs> Tinder. I'm a big fan of let them have the thing that works for them. It's like Scientology. Keep them in a building. Um, keep them in a building. And, you know, I, I think comedians sort of, our job is to play devil's advocate sometimes and to go, okay, everyone is against this one thing. I'm going to challenge myself to find all the positives in it. You did a good job with that. Thank you. And I don't totally think sex robots are going to fix everything. I, I did think it was an interesting sort of joke solution till we figure out the sexual harassment thing, like an interim, the way we would use like crash test dummies or something um, to stop real women from getting harmed was the joke area I was in. But I did find that the fear of robots did feel largely male mm. in terms of whether it's the movies we've seen or whatever. But I've, you know, a lot of my guy friends are like, well, the robots are going to kill us and the robots are going to be stronger than yeah. us. I'm like, well, Women are always dealing with that. Like, like something stronger than us that might eventually kill us. Like, that's right. every guy we've ever dated. Like, this is the first time you guys have ever had something that might kill you. So true. You I know? didn't even think about so that. So I was like, the robots might protect us from you. <gasps> I would like Did to have... Did it just dawn on you? I'd like to have a big, scary robot in every parking structure at 2 in the morning when I walk to my car. And... Uh, you know, people are saying, well, the robots are going to replace human women. I'm like, well, I, every woman I know would love to have a double. I know. I love that part in your special when you're like, yeah, because you're expected to be everything and anything. And of course, I want somebody at home cooking and Female cleaning Female robots that cook and clean? Yeah. Yes, please. Sign me up. I don't do it anyways. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't. I'm almost the perfect woman. I just don't cook and clean. Yeah, the perfect woman knows her limitations. Hey! And okay, I want to talk about, because you like talking about, and you're very open. You're just so open. Really? She's like an open box. She's oh just my like, gosh. Oh my gosh. God. <laughs> I do love how your boobs just jiggle around. No, I know. That's unbelievably squishy. I love milky. It so much. You talk about failure in mm -hmm. a really great way that I think that this next generation really needs to understand. Oh, because you have had five specials, you had uh, Whitney, you had mm -hmm. two broke girls, mm -hmm. and you got to this place that was like amazing, but I want to know what, what, how did you get there? Because yeah. it couldn't have been easy and I want to hear yeah. about it. You know, and I think for me, it's taken me a long time to realize that like failure is so, re I mean, having a show on the air for six years, like I don't think that's a, like I never thought I was going to get any of this. Like yeah. I just wanted- That's a big deal. I just want to pay my bills. Right. And be able to tell jokes for drunk people and that's all <laughs> I wanted, you know? And so anything else is extra credit, bonus points. And, you know, I think that it, it did, it was hard for me when I did a show uh, on NBC, which had my name on it. You know, this was before there were a million shows on television that got, you know, picked up, canceled, picked up, canceled. It was like having a show get publicly canceled was did feel humiliating, but I did a talk show to sitcom. <laughs> Hello, That's have crazy. you done? Have you done a I sitcom? I have health insurance. <laughs> How could this be a failure? What are you talking about? But you talk about failure. Yes, and I in what sense? In our echo chamber, I felt like a failure because I think in my head I was like, this should go for eight years and be Seinfeld or something, uh... you know. And shooting for the moon is great, but if you don't get there, you don't have to go, I'm a you know, failure. So at the time, I was definitely embarrassed and devastated uh, because I thought everyone, all anyone was talking about was how big of a failure I was. And when reality, people were like, she had a show in the air. Great. What happened to that? Yeah, because I was, I mean, in in like figuring out all the shows that you had done yeah. and in talking to my writer and yeah. just figuring this out, I was like... Yeah but she's had so many shows. <laughs> I just don't understand. But you have been so open about failure, so that's why I really wanted to get to the bottom of this. And I think I've also had a lot of shows that never got on the air. 
Oh. So I had a you know deal with HBO. I had before I had a show get on the air. I had three pilots that didn't go, and I've been very public about not just talking about my highlight reel because I think a lot of people might look at someone like you and go, she's had this and she has her own podcast and she's on the cover of these magazines and she's got all these followers and like we don't broadcast the things we didn't get. Mm -hmm. We don't broadcast the auditions that we you know didn't book or right. the TV shows that didn't go right. because nobody wants to cover that and you're not going to get a magazine cover for a pilot that didn't go to series. Mm -hmm. This <laughs> you is know? true. So I try to go like you know failure is a part of the learning process and failure is a integral part of success. I thank God I had three shows that didn't go by the time I had a show that did go because then I knew how to freaking write. Mm. That was all practice. So I, I don't like calling it failure. I like to call it practice, you know, because you don't go to the, like if you're a bodybuilder, when you're going to the gym, you're not calling those failure days. You're calling those like workout days, right? And so I, I just, I like to, I what think. What do you call them? Uh, I'm, practice practice. Days. It's practice. Practice So days. I had two pilots that didn't go, but those were practice. They weren't meant to go. Thank God they didn't go. I like that. And I do think for, you know, younger people that are embarking on this journey, just I promise you the thing right now that you want so bad that you didn't get, you're going to look back and go, oh, thank God I didn't get that. I always say if I didn't get a job, it wasn't mine. And it took a couple of jobs to not get Love it. going through the anxiety, the worry, the like, oh, my God, my life is over yeah. moments. Yep. But because I didn't get those jobs, mm -hmm. thank God I didn't get those jobs, they weren't mine. Nope. Bigger opportunities come. They never were. And that is, I think it took me so long to understand that. And I see a lot of people who are blowing up their careers because yeah. they got something too soon mm -hmm. and they didn't have the gratitude yet and they hadn't eaten enough shit yet. So when they did get it, they blew it. Boom. What's next for Whitney Cummings? Um, I'm starting a podcast. It's called uh, Good For You. And it's all just people coming on talking about things that have been good for them in a funny way. The, you know... That sort of deal. A lot of comedians coming on. That's great. I'm just, I'm just very excited when women get into a space that men use their confidence to get into, and we're like, I don't know if I'm good enough, and I have to be perfect, and yeah. I don't want to take up any space. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go take up space. Oh, take up as much space as you want, Whitney Cummings. The last thing we do on yeah. Pretty Big Deal is a little lightning round. Okay, and love. I just need you to answer the question. Okay, I feel like this is going to. So, me. what's the last pretty penny you spent? A podcast studio. Oh, Invest yeah. in yourself. I built a podcast studio in my home so that I can wake up and walk right to it. I love that so idea. So I can be rested and I'm not driving. What's the biggest deal breaker? Selfies for men. <laughs> that is a deal breaker. <laughs> but no, with like friends or with men? Anything. You just said it. That's a, that's a deal breaker. Being a DJ? Oh, yeah. Okay. Got yeah. it. Okay, so... <laughs> You're obviously a pretty big deal because I only have pretty big deals on my show. Oh, I like that. What's Thank a pretty you. big deal to you? It's a pretty big deal to me when someone um, does the right thing when no one's watching. <gasps> oh, my God. My guest right before you just said that. What? That's, That's plagiarism. Who? You guys Who is this rich? You should be friends. Who? Whitney Cummings. She's stealing, Thank you. stealing my brand. Whitney Cummings is on my podcast. <laughs> Okay, everybody at home, we want to hear from you. Please comment on Instagram and Twitter. Be nice. Be nice because the person who runs her social media will come for you or I will come for you. <laughs> so make sure to watch, share. We love you guys. Bye.